feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. Hey everybody, welcome to another great episode of The Shrimp Tank where we interview some of the brightest and best CEOs and entrepreneurs in and around the United States. I'm your co-host Ted Jenkins, of course, with my co-host Lee Heisman. And if you wanna see a replay of all the broadcasts of the entrepreneurs that we do across the country, simply go to shrimptankpodcast.com. You can always download the podcast at iHeartRadio, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or anywhere around the internet. And because of the great interviews that we do on camera, you should absolutely go to our YouTube channel, just go to Shrimp Tank Podcast, click the subscribe button, and make sure you hit that notification bell. That's the way you're gonna be able to get all of these in your inbox. We are delighted today because we talk to a lot of private business owners, but today having the CEO of a publicly traded company, William Santana Lee, the CEO of Nightscope, we're excited to talk about his business and talk about what it's like to lead a publicly traded company because a lot of business owners ask us all the time, should I take my company public? Should I do an Elon Musk and keep it private today? You know, what's the best way to be able to handle the company? Now, I just wanted to start off because uh, the, the deeper I got into doing research on Nightscope, the more fascinated I became because obviously there are two big issues, Bill, that are going on in America, right? One is that AI is growing at rapid pace right now. And we know crime in America is also growing at a rapid pace as well. And so how does Nightscope play in that in terms of what you do and the solutions that you're providing to cities all across America? Well, greetings from uh, Silicon Valley, uh, Ted and Lee. Thanks for uh, having us. Uh, yeah, you, you hit it straight on. Uh, technology can have a massively positive impact on society. Uh, crime has a $2 trillion negative economic impact on the US every single year. It's a hidden tax we all pay and blood, tears and treasure. And what we've been doing at Nightscope for the last almost 10 years now uh, is building profound new technology to address a recurring societal problem with a recurring revenue business model. Uh, and we built these crazy autonomous security robots that are now patrolling across the country. Yeah, so I wanna ask you because as a business owner, I've always heard of the SaaS model. And then I saw some companies, Lee knows this well, with the HAS model. And then I noticed it's the first time I think I've ever seen it of a, of a MAAS, a mass model. Could you talk to me about that? Because when I looked at the differential and cost of having an automated solution with a machine relative to a human being, the numbers to me just look staggering as probably municipalities are looking at this across America. Uh, yeah, so we have a machine as a service business model. Uh, we don't sell hardware or software. Everything's basically included. Uh, the data storage, telecom, decal, shipping, maintenance, support, everything, it's one throat to choke. Uh, and it can be as high as $9 an hour uh, for our technology, indoors or outdoors, as low as 75 cents an hour. Uh, so it's very difficult for leaders to say, oh, our people are our most important asset. Well, why aren't you using the most advanced technology to better secure them? If you compare that to uh, unarmed security guards, 15 to $35 an hour, um, uh, an off-duty law enforcement officer armed is probably on the order of 85 bucks an hour. Right. Uh, so this is a, a massive change uh, for massive opportunity. So Bill, go back a little bit, because of course our, our listeners and subscribers are going to be able to look you up on the website and see video about night, a night scope, of course, and that's K-N-I-G-T. Uh, GHT, pardon me, but just kind of do a high-end overview. How exactly does it operate? Is this a robot? Is this an AI robot like the movies? I know what it is, but if you could describe to our listeners how it operates in a very overview of it. Sure, sure, Lee. We, we work for Big Brother and all the robots are coming <laughs> to kill everyone and take everyone's job. And we've been working really hard. Oh, sorry, wrong talking point. Um, <laughs> so the way this works is uh, basically you want to think to two different things. One is just very uh, simply provide a physical deterrent to stop negative behavior in the first place. So think of um, if I put a cop car in front of uh, the side of the road on, um, on a highway, no matter what speed you're doing, you're going to pump those brakes or you're going to look down at your speedometer, right? And you mean by uh, that an unarmed, an unmanned, pardon me, even an unmanned cop car? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just physically being there can stop. Or if I put a marked law enforcement vehicle in front of your home or your office, criminal behavior will change. So most of these crimes are crimes of passion or in the moment. 
Um, and so you can stop a lot of silly stuff from happening in the first place by just physically being there. So if you pull up and you see a five foot tall, three foot wide, 400 pound machine roaming around the strobe lights going, it says police or security on the side of the road. It's making some sounds and may greet you. Like you're going to think twice before you're going to go steal that car. And that's literally what our uh, clients have been enjoying. Uh, I think the second thing is how can we give the 2 million officers and guards eyes, ears, and voice on the ground in multiple locations at the same time. So one math problem people don't seem to understand is you can't have 2 million officers and guards trying to secure 332 million Americans across 50 states. Like the math doesn't work. And oh, by the way, you can't triple shift a human. So you actually need four for every post. So you got to divide that by four. So now you have 500,000 humans trying to secure 332 million Americans. Like, oh, oh by the way, with the technological equivalent of a number two pencil and a notepad. Like we would never put a soldier in a theater of war with this embarrassing level of technology. And so what we've been doing is, okay, this is broken. Uh, the Department of Justice and Homeland Security have no federal jurisdiction over these 19,000 agencies and out there 8,000 security firms. How can we build something to give them almost superhuman capabilities at their fingertips? Uh, and those are the two things you want to think about how they work is how do I gather data from the environment and, right. and provide a tool for the officers and guards? And how do I physically stop silly stuff from happening? So, Bill, with these municipalities, do you end up getting in a private public partnership where you can access some of the data and then deploy the robots to certain areas where you can collect more information uh, to sort of have uh, prevent some of the crime? And also, how do you see it going in schools with obviously the tragedies we've seen you know the last couple of years will these robots end up in schools uh they're already in schools we have multiple clients we actually announced one this uh this morning uh universities k through 12 uh folks are starting to understand that uh this can can be very helpful uh one thing is i probably spent too much time with lawyers you said the data there is not one form of data <laughs> these machines generate over 90 terabytes of data a year uh, wow. that no human's going to be able to process. So some of it um, stays on the machine and it's for health monitoring kind of things. Some of it may go up and down to the cloud for processing. Um, some may get, uh, will stay on the machine and, and get overwritten over time because it's not needed or it goes up uh, and stays up in the cloud. Contractually to avoid the big brother, you know, uh, talking point, all the data is uh, that is security related is owned by our clients, not by us. We're not selling the data. We're not monetizing the data. We're not doing any anything else with it other than helping our clients with their uh, security issues and public safety, or in most cases, they'll allow us to use the data to improve our, our algorithms. Um, but uh, I guess another nuance is a majority of our clients have a security operations center or a 911 dispatch, you know, they're running 24 seven. But if you might deploy a machine at a, an apartment complex, right? The community manager doesn't have a 24 seven staff, sure. right? Uh, so they might hire us uh, um, and check the box on, on Nightscope Plus, uh, And then we can provide that remote monitoring on their behalf uh, with former law enforcement and former military folks. Bill, let me take a step back and talk about you, the entrepreneur, the CEO. Uh -oh. You have a looking well, looking at your history. <laughs> it seems like it's almost seems like you're cutting edge, almost bleeding. If you look at your history and you look at developed the world's first purpose built law enforcement vehicle, pioneered a new OEM at Build to Order. Now you have Nightscope. Tell us a little bit about you and how you find yourself kind of on the tip of the spear of a lot of these technologies. Do you do you look for that? Are you always trying to initiate some level of, of getting out there first to market? No, just trying to fix the damn problem. Um, <laughs> so the country's over 200 years old. We're in a 46th president and crime and, and violence across the country are unacceptable levels. I don't believe the founders of our country ever expected us to build a society. We're going to work, going to school or going to a movie theater literally came with the risk of being shot or killed. I'm sorry, that's not OK. Um, the private sector and the public sector are not going to fix this if they're left to their own devices. We have a couple hundred years of history to prove that. Um, so I frankly are looking and developing solutions to the problem and stop whining about it. And we're not, you know, I'm not a roboticist. 
Uh, all I want is to fix the crime problem. I want to see if it's a ludicrous, crazy mission that we have for Nightscope uh, to see if we can make the U.S. the safest country in the world. Uh, you're not going to do that by us by ourselves, right? We need uh, as many supporters um, and clients as possible. Uh, there's going to be a lot of folks in the public sector and the private sector uh, to work hand in hand and we'll try to foster those relationships. But uh, sure, we might end up at the cutting edge of technology with autonomy, robotics, AI, and electric vehicle technology all combined into one. But that's not a desire to just push the envelope from a technical standpoint, because it's actually really hard, by the way. Um, it, it's just to try to fix the problem. And if you don't think the technology can actually help fix the problem, uh, just go to nightscope.com slash crime, and you've got a nice long list of wins that these uh, machines have already provided uh, a positive impact on society. Bill, a lot of people are wondering here that they may own a very successful company and they may be thinking about taking it public. There are some people, obviously, I mentioned at the beginning, like Elon Musk that just took one of the a big company like Twitter uh, private. Uh, do you see any advantages or disadvantages of being a publicly traded company, especially when you think about potentially needing capital to continue to grow the size of the company? How do, how do you handle that today? And how do you, how, when, when the company, um, is growing and it may report losses in the beginning. How do you build that relationship with Wall Street to try to direct them on how the company will do in the future? I, I mean, it's a it's a tricky one. Uh, not every company should be public and not every company should be private. You kind of need to think about it as I often uh, counsel founders and entrepreneurs. Uh, they spend a lot of time on product market fit, product market fit but spend very little time on capital to company fit. What is the type of investor that you need uh, to build and, and grow your company? For us, uh, the way we, the manner in which we raise the capital, um, prior to the public listing, we had raised uh, north of $120 million wow. from 35,000 investors. Um, and that, you know that's not necessarily normal. So we we're already reporting as if we were publicly traded without any of the benefits for several years uh, to the SEC. Uh, we listed the company uh, on, on NASDAQ uh, January of this year under the ticker symbol KSCP. And, you know, that gives us the opportunity to do multiple things. Uh, one, uh, in a prior life, when I was a director of mergers and acquisitions at Ford Motor Company, uh, subsequently was the founder and chief operating officer for a subsidiary I built for them. Uh, I had bought 22 companies in 11 months. Um, so uh, we, my half the, half the management team at Nightscope is very fluent in M&A, um, and it might give us a currency to uh, make more acquisitions. And uh, and we brought that to fruition. We actually announced our first acquisition uh, last month and closed on it. Um, so I think that gives us a, a unique opportunity. And then access to the, the wider uh, capital markets is also important. And, you know, a lot of folks think that and the private sector, especially VC funded stuff is uh, an order magnitude or 10 times order of the magnitude of the size that it actually is. Um, you know, pr private financing is actually extremely small uh, out of the multi-trillion dollar capital markets. Um, so, you know, if we're serious about making the U.S. the safest country in the world, you're not going to do that, you know, with four, in you know, small VCs in, you know, in the white ivory tower and going to command, you know, success in, uh, across the nation, you're going to have to have a massive cross section of the public want to support doing something like this. And that's what we found. You know, our investors have been judges, lawyers, teachers, students, um, faculty members, uh, former, you know, NYPD detectives, FBI, CIA, DHS, who are all financially aligned. Uh, for the long term to make sure that Nightscope is successful. Yeah, because uh, if we win, say that, everybody wins. I saw a model uh, very similar to that of what you're talking about with the company called Boxable. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, you may have heard of it, but it's a very interesting company for those that haven't seen it, creating these very, very small 
cost affordable homes trying to solve that solution in a lot of cities of you know how, how do people get housing for and, and that's why i love founders and entrepreneurs i mean we're just trying to fix the damn problem <laughs> no I, I your your history speaks for itself bill and what you've done and how you go about doing it you don't just jump onto a train you almost create your own direction take a step back for me real quick i i understand the dynamics of how the product works do you find that it is a really good supplement for your clients and the clients that use it, such as they have, so you mentioned an apartment complex that might have a property manager or a small security department. Can this supplement the remaining, you know, someone does an eight hour shift and then you get an additional 16, or do you find the majority of your clientele where this is completely independent and they've never had any security before? Where do you see that breakdown? Both and, and everything in between. So it's highly client dependent and highly location dependent. Um, so a property manager uh, for commercial real estate that is dealing with warehouses has a different profile than, um, you know, a subdivision for, you know, 350, you know, family homes uh, versus uh, a corporate campus um, or school. Um, it's kind of everything in between. And that's why we, now that we've done this a long time, our machines have operated, I think, well north of 1.7 or 1. million, uh, 1.8 million hours across the country. Uh, we have a pretty strict process on how we onboard a client. We've got a massive checklist of all the things like, what what's your problem? How can we help? Can we technically do it? And there's like uh, all kinds of things that uh, our team goes through to make sure that we can actually be helpful for for that client. But it, it varies, in Bill, including, I have to ask shi one more. including shift patterns. And that makes sense. And I have to ask a question. A lot of our listeners, we call them the C-level suite, the executives, the, the CEOs, entrepreneurs, and also the entrepreneurs, people that want to become entrepreneurs, want to, to take that next step. Everybody thinks you sit, you spoke of the ivory tower and you're sitting at the ivory tower here at the end of 10 years of innovating this and making this. What were some of the main challenges that you ran into over the past decade that you said, you know, I, I'm human. I, we've made some mistakes. These are the mistakes we've made. And how fast do you pivot on that? Do you have any mistakes? No, Lee and Ted, I mean, <laughs> I, I, there are no challenges. Everything has gone exactly according to plan to the minute. Why That's what everybody a question thinks. like that? <laughs> I mean, Jesus. Um, <laughs> well, uh, sure. Everything that we worried about that was going to go wrong didn't go wrong. Uh, the the five or ten things that weren't on the list all happened, right? <laughs> and exactly. it's because if you're at the cutting edge technology, no one's physically done this at scale in the history of mankind. Yeah, a couple of things might not go exactly the well, way you want. And Bill, my question, I know we could spend three hours on just the things that went wrong. In your experience, you have a, a plethora of experience and you've gone through this many times prior to this organization and this business. What was the one thing maybe off the top of your head that you just didn't see coming that you had to quickly address? Uh honestly financing the company I, i've okay. done now I'm not proud to say but i've done more financial engineering than than actual engineering which is not <laughs> what i want to be doing but you know i live here in silicon valley a couple hundred billion dollars of capital goes into startups every year it took me in 2013 like 364 days just to raise the seed round uh, because i was told the following um hey bill you're out of your mind this will never work um, it's hardware and software, too complicated. You should pick one, uh, completely <laughs> devoid <laughs> of a problem we're trying to fix. Uh, and lastly, physical security is not an investment thesis and you need to go away. And so when the entire Valley basically tells you no, no, and no, and I didn't take too kindly toward, you know, to it, I was like, okay, well, uh, that was the wrong answer. So I will go force what needs to happen uh, and I'm grateful and thankful for the 35,000 investors that bet on us uh, and a majority of them for the long term, because they know this is going to take a long time. You're not, you know, this problem has gotten created over a couple hundred years. We're not going to do this or fix it over two or three quarters, right? We have spent nearly uh, a decade on this. I'm prepared to spend another two or three decades to force the win. I think we've got a shot to build a $30 billion company that kind of looks like a, a defense contractor. Uh, like a Lockheed or General Dynamics or, or Boeing, but instead is focused on 
Homeland Security, law enforcement, and and the private security market. Bill, you know, I'm I'm wondering, you know, you're obviously in one of the the meccas of the world for technology, and there's such a competition for talent today. And obviously, you've got very sophisticated machines. Like, how do you identify the talent that can program and build these machines? And then, more importantly, how do you how do you retain them over time when when they're getting offers thrown at them every day and, and protect you know the intellectual property of what you've built? I, I'm I'm surrounded by an an awesome team. There's in, this is like almost an impossibility to to found a company. Uh, get it funded, grow it, uh, list it on NASDAQ, and then subsequently go buy a company. Like you can't do that by yourself. And I often say to my team, like teamwork makes the dream work. Um, and <laughs> part of this is we got a bunch of crate, you know, I thought I was sometimes, you know, CEO job can be pretty lonely and pretty painful and brutal. Um, and you can ask me about the founder's diet if you like, but the um, having a team that is just as maniacal or just as determined or just as stubborn um, makes a huge difference. Like folks that do well at Nightscope uh, resonate with the the mission. Like, like you guys think we're kidding. No, we literally want to see if we can make the U.S. the safest country in the world. It's not something we kid around. Uh, if you're an engineer, it's like, hey, you get to build work on autonomous technology, robotics, AI, and electric vehicles all combined into one. And we're actually shipping stuff out in the field with real clients. It's not a science project. You know, $100 billion gone in self-driving, autonomous, I don't know what, a couple hundred companies working on it. Their collective revenue is uh, close to zero, if not zero, um, <laughs> and haven't actually shipped anything. So it's a very unique place uh, for some types of folks that uh, can withstand the volatility and, and, the, and the stress levels. Um and just, you know, kind of seeing those successes in the marketplace continue to drive uh, people. Uh, this is not for the faint hearted, right? People like think they uh, Silicon Valley is like Hollywood. I'm going to go be an actress and I'm just going to go hang out at the fun lifestyle of, of being a startup. And it's like, no, actually, you know, you know, what most of us go through is the the founder's diet is like you get, you know, kicked in the face for breakfast, punched in the stomach for lunch. <laughs> body slam for dinner. <laughs> and then you got to get up the next morning and talk to Ted and Lee all smiley and, and ready to go. Like, <laughs> and this is every day and you got to be brilliant. able to do it for weeks, months and years. And in our case, decades, uh, and be able to be that mentally strong and that determined to force a win. So yeah. Bill, let me, let me say, number one, Lee and Ted always do not have a smile on their face. It's dependent on the guests. So number one, you're bringing the that smile. That was not disclosed to me. <laughs> Number two, I and I know we need to wrap up, but I need to ask something, and I know Ted's going to end on one, but you said something that resonated, Bill. I've been doing this now for seven years with Ted, and you know, before podcasting got popular, of course, and as I mentioned, we're in 15 cities across the country, and I get the opportunity to listen to brilliant people like yourself. I always pull away something, and there's something you said that's resonated now, which is I force the win. And, and I, I love that. If you could simply speak on that a little bit and people take for granted, you know, that you work real or hard and is there always a win? You said, I need to force the win. Can you kind of elaborate on that mindset for our entrepreneurs listening? Yeah, the, probably the, the best advice I can give a, a founder or an entrepreneur considering what they're going to do next. You better pick something that you believe to the bone. Uh, you know, you my wife says I'm possessed. You have got to be able to sleep, drink. Uh, you know, I'm watching a movie. I'm not watching the movie. I'm like, oh, that's a cool idea. Maybe we can use that. That's an interesting font. <laughs> oh, that's a really cool surface. Like, I'm not really paying attention. All it's, I have night scope glasses on, anything and everything that's going to move. And why you need to do that is, you know, 95% of startups fail. And you got to be willing to have the courage the the stamina and the fight in you to you know if i close 35,000 investors imagine how many people said no right <laughs> and you got to be told Brilliant. all day long no 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 and you got to be willing to get up and go not only are you wrong i'm going to prove you so wrong it's going to hurt and but you got to pick something that you really believe in you know, I was born in New York City. Someone hit my town on 9-11. I'm still massively pissed off about it. So the rest of my life, 
I'm dedicating to better securing this country. You don't want to bet against a team that is that determined to force that win. And you've got to surround yourself with unbelievable people that have that passion and determination. But when it's three in the morning and everything that happened that day went wrong, you can't sit and like the auditors don't care. Your lawyers don't care. Your teammates, in some cases, they aren't privy or don't care. Um, or your clients don't care. Your suppliers don't care. You have to get up and go figure it out and work the problem. But you're not going to have enough energy to work the problem if you don't believe it to the, you know, down to the bone. This is uh, this is awesome stuff in here. I'm wondering, uh, as we wrap up in here, are you at liberty to tell us um, who the most famous or a famous celebrity investor that's invested in Nightscope? Oh, geez, I wouldn't know. I mean, I, I'm not trying to be cute. Like 35,000 <laughs> investors wrote a check. I mean, from every walk of of life. Um, so I I don't know. I know there's some uh, rap artists have, some yeah. judges have, uh, vice presidents of you know major corporations, uh, mayors. <laughs> there is a student I remember. I think he was 13 or 15. Um, just hardcore got his parents to write a check. <laughs> uh, another, I think, a high school student or is a college student like. I often do, if you haven't checked, if you want to see the robots in real life, go to nightscope.com slash roadshow. We have this crazy pod going across the country that you can actually see the robots in person. And this uh, particular investor, a uh, really young person, flew from Atlanta, I think, to DC to got, not only go to the pod, but get on a Zoom call with me in the pod to subsequently go through his due diligence list of all the, I mean, like hardcore. And I love it. I was like, okay. This guy is this, this guy's for real. Did you hire and, him after that? Did you offer him a job? Uh, no, but <laughs> I think he's still I think he's still studying. Fair, um, fair. And, uh, you know, you, you get that many people motivated about something. Uh, you just got to keep at it. And, you, and, you know, days are going to go bad. Trading volumes aren't where you want. The share price is, you know, at an annoying a number that should never be there. But, you know, the whole world's upside down. Yeah. People don't care. You got to kind of work through it and and just keep at it. And the one thing that I, I, I want to make sure your listeners understand if, if they're looking at Nightscope is, you know, criminals and terrorists uh, can be anywhere. Nightscope long term to succeed has to be everywhere. And with all the pandemic supply chain, interest rates, market volatility, I can assure you the criminals aren't sitting there looking at interest rates. They're not looking at market volatility or crypto crashes or what have you. This is an ongoing societal problem that we're going to address and are addressing, regardless of the macroeconomic, macro political wins. Well, I have to say, after this uh, podcast here, Lee and I are not only fans, we're going to buy some shares of your stock as well. Uh, <laughs> no question. We're, we're going we're gonna to ride with you after this interview. And uh, that's, that's very kind. We always, folks we that are watching the today, sport. is the best place to go to nightscope.com slash roadshow? Is that the best place to basically learn more about the company? Uh, yeah, nightscope.com with plenty of stuff there. If you want to physically see the machines, I think we're, we've got mostly undisclosed locations for the balance of the year, but the 2023 uh, roadshow is getting planned and, and will get announced uh, uh, soon. It's It's been an, an awesome opportunity for people to come touch, see and feel and, and get their questions answered. Well, I have to say, I mean, uh, we always get to talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, but I mean, just feeling your passion today in this interview, anybody that wants to be an entrepreneur, private company or public uh, company, that's the number one thing that you need is a passion for what you're doing every day. Thank you so much for not only doing this interview today, but thank you for changing America, trying to make us a safer place. Uh, Lee and I both love that mission. And uh, we're gonna look forward to being shareholders and uh, follow, awesome. follow, follow your journey. That. So, uh, thanks so much and appreciate you being on the shrimp tank today. Absolutely, be safe out there. Thanks everybody. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond.